Political polarization is a great problem of our time. This panel will consider the de deformation of the separation of powers as a factor in political polarization. Executive administrative decisions tend to be more extreme than legislative solutions, particularly when, as is often the case, the houses of Congress and the presidency are divided on party lines. So Congress's delegation of policy decisions to the administrative agencies results in regulations that can shift radically between administrations, creating what some might call government by whiplash. This panel will consider whether institutional restorations like curbing the, uh, of the delegation doctrine or, and Chevron deference might help in restoring a constitution of compromise. I'm going to uh, introduce each of our panelists in the order that they will speak. Each of them will speak for about uh, 10 minutes before then we have an opportunity for exchange of views and then eventually uh, questions uh, from the audience. Um, as usual, the uh, Federalist Society has assembled an all-star panel of experts uh, to discuss uh, this topic. When we, when we get to the opportunity for questions and answers, I, I will remind you, these are the panelists. <laughs> they were invited to be the experts. Uh, we welcome questions. Uh, we welcome an opportunity for exchange of views, but I don't think any of you are panelists, so you might want to keep that in mind. <laughs> Our first speaker will be Michael Rappaport. Uh, he is the Hugh and Hazel Darling Professor of Law at the University of San Diego School of Law, where he is also the director of the Center for the Study of Constitutional Originalism. Professor Rappaport teaches constitutional law and administrative law. He's worked in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice and practiced law uh, appellate law with Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher in D.C. He received his Juris Doctrine and a DCL in Political Theory from Yale Law School. Our second speaker, Ajit Pai, a former chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, is a non-resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute where he studies issues about technology and innovation, telecommunications regulatory policy, and market-based incentives for investments in broadband deployment. He is also a partner at Searchlight Capital Partners, a global investment firm. He graduated with honors from Harvard University and from the University of Chicago Law School. Our third speaker uh, is Professor Victoria Nurse. Uh, Professor Nurse is the Ralph E. Whitworth Professor of Law at the Georgetown University Law Center here, where she is also the director of the law school's first center on congressional studies. She is one of the nation's leading scholars on statutory interpretation, Congress, and the separation of powers. In 2015 and 16, she served as chief counsel to the vice president of the United States. She also served as an appellate lawyer in the Department of Justice and a special counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Professor Nurse graduated from Stanford University and from the University of California Bolt Hall School of Law. And finally, uh, our final uh, speaker is Neil Devins. Um, Professor Devins is the Sandra Day O'Connor Professor of Law and Professor of Government at the College of William and Mary. He is the author of several books and more than 100 articles and book chapters on courts, constitutional law, and law and politics. He also served as Assistant General Counsel for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Professor Devins is a graduate of Georgetown University and Vanderbilt Law School. So without further ado, Professor Rappaport. Well, I want to thank the Federalist Society for inviting me to talk about an important issue. Um, the polarization of American politics is obviously a very serious issue. 
And today I want to argue that a significant contributor to polarization is presidential unilateralism. And that we could reduce polarization by moving away from unilateralism to political structures that require congressional consent. My talk today is based on a, a, an article that John McGinnis and I have, have co-written. Well, presidential unilateralism involves a government structure where the president has the power to take actions, such as pass regulations, initiate military action, or make, make international agreements that traditionally require the assent of Congress. Allowing the president to unilaterally take these actions contributes to polarization because it leads to more extreme actions. If these actions could only be taken with the concurrence of Congress, then the parties would have to work out compromises, especially during the usual situation where we have divided government. Government action would then be more moderate and less threatening to people from the other party. Well, let me start by defining polarization. I view it as a combination of, on the one hand, a sharp division between the political parties on policy issues, and secondly, an us versus them mentality between the parties. So first, that sharp division means that elections take on enormous importance because the loser will really lose big in a world of unilateralism. The sharp division and the resulting fear of losing elections leads to this us versus them mentality, right? With people viewing the other party not so much as opponents, but as a threat to the country who should be demonized. Now, one of the principal ways that unilateralism occurs is through the congressional delegation of regulatory authority to the president and to the executive branch. This delegation leads to enormous polarization. Regulations are more likely to be extreme if they are enacted through delegations than if they are enacted through Congress. If they are enacted by the president, then they will reflect the president's policies. And presidents tend to occupy the median of their party. Thus, regulations from the president tend to be relatively extreme. By contrast, if the regulation has to go through Congress and the president together, it's going to be much more likely to be moderate, right? If there's divided government, and divided government holds maybe three quarters of the time, there will certainly need to be compromise, which will bring the regulation much closer to the median voter of the country rather than the median voter of the party. But even if there is not divided government, the regulation is still likely to be moderate. Um, due to factors such as the filibuster rule and the need for the majority to protect its most moderate members who are from swing states, swing seats, swing seats. Um, well, in a world where Congress was needed to enact regulation, regulations, polarization would significantly decrease. The parties would need to get legislation in order to pass those regulations. Thus, people of each party would not have to fear as much the election of a president from the other party, since its consequences would not be so significant. Since they would not have to fear the other side so much, they would develop much less of an us versus them attitude towards the other side. <coughs> well, if delegations are the problem, then what can, what can be done to cut back on them? The most obvious solution would be for the Supreme Court to hold that delegations of policy-making discretion to the executive are unconstitutional. The non-delegation doctrine, perhaps you've heard of it. Um, a strong decision cutting back on delegations obviously would have a dramatic effect. But there are other possibilities. One possibility is for Congress to pass a law, such as the proposed RAINS Act, which would allow agencies to draft regulations but would not permit them to be promulgated without Congress approving of them. 
If this procedure was applied only to major regulations, and if, it's, and if it significantly limited congressional debate on those regulations, it could be feasibly applied to the most important regulations that agencies pass each year. The policy-making discretion of agencies could also be decreased if Chevron and our deference were either eliminated or reduced. While my presentation focuses on uh, more on these domestic matters of regulation, similar arguments can be made about military and foreign affairs. In these areas, presidents have both usurped and been delegated powers that have led to more extreme actions. Unilateral presidential decisions to take offensive military action leads to more, controver more controversial wars as compared to the more consensus-supported wars that Congress would declare under the Constitution's original meaning. Similarly, unilateral executive agreements lead to more extreme agreements as compared to the agreements that could be ratified as treaties under the Constitution's original meaning. Well, let me consider just one objection to my argument here. My argument assumes that the parties can cooperate and compromise in order to pass legislation. But it might be argued that the parties are simply not willing to compromise. Instead, the members of Congress opposed to the president's party will not be willing to compromise with the president because they prefer to deny the president a victory that would enhance his chances for re-election. And for the same reason, the president will veto initiatives from Congress that would give the other party a victory. But I think this objection is mistaken. Simply because this is how the parties behave now under unilateralism, and it's true, they do, does not mean that's how they would behave under more consensus structures. The parties would, have, would behave differently because they have different incentives under these two regimes. At present, the, the president has broad authority to enact the regulations he favors. Thus, the president has no incentive to compromise with Congress. And the Congress cannot secure any improvement in their situation by compromising with the president to give him more authority. The best that the Congress can hope to do now is to secure the presidency in the next election. And so they act to deny the president a victory. But things would be different, very different, in a world where the president can adopt, cannot adopt regulations on his own. In that world, the president and the governing party could not get much enacted without compromise. If they refuse to compromise, both special interest groups and the general public would become frustrated, very frustrated, and would put pressure on the party that would not compromise. This would change their behavior. In the end, moving from unilateralism to consensus structures would reduce polarization. It's an important part of the cure for what ails us. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, as is typically the case with speakers, I should offer my gratitude first to the Federal Society for hosting this uh, event, and in particular, hosting it in person. It's great to be anywhere with anybody in the same room. Um, <laughs> That said, I have a couple of gripes with the Federal Society this afternoon. First, this event is allocated the time frame of 11.45 to 1.30, and I was led to believe that you were willing and able to hear my discursus on the Interstate Commerce Commission Act of 1881 for that entire period. So I'm shortening substantially what I plan to say in, as a result of the comedy owed to my fellow participants. Uh, secondly, the mug I'm using is a little bit smaller than I'm used to, but we'll get past that as well. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, secondly, I want to thank our moderator, Judge Pryor, for moderating this. I told him before the event, my very first assignment on my very first day for former Senator Sessions back in 2004 was to draft a press release for a nominee who was about to be announced uh, as a, a nominee to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. And I reviewed his resume, looked at some of his writings, and I thought, I like the jib of this guy. And sure enough, Judge Pryor has done a fantastic job on the U.S. Court of Appeals, and we're grateful for his judicial service. I will say he also offered what I would argue is the greatest series of exchanges ever uttered in a confirmation hearing, which you may remember, Judge. Uh, Senator Durbin, now the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, asked him to characterize his political philosophy. And without hesitation, Judge Pryor said, I'm a conservative. And Senator Durbin followed up, would you say you're a moderate conservative or an extreme conservative? <laughs> without biting the eyelash, then nominee Pryor said, some people in Alabama would consider me a moderate. <laughs> Bravo, absolutely, <laughs> spot on. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you as well to my fellow panelists. I have to say it's with some trepidation I'm even participating on this panel as a professor, 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 ex-bureaucrat in an arguably unconstitutional independent agency. It's like, <laughs> not quite a fair fight here, but nonetheless, I'll do battle with the, the arms that I've been given. Uh, but speaking of which, I think Professor Rappaport framed quite well some of the issues that are animating this event today. And let me stipulate to a few things up front that he and the judge mentioned. First, it goes without saying, this is a time of unusual polarization. I think the factors that contribute to that are you know, multivariable, but uh, Professor Rappaport outlines some of them. Let me stipulate as well that the separation of powers concerns can, in a time of divided government, heighten that polarization. There's no question of that. Uh, I'm sure many in this room might disagree with some of the decisions that the current administration has made, just as many disagreed on the other side of the aisle with those made by the previous administration. Let me also stipulate that government by whiplash is indeed a real phenomenon. Uh, regulations change from administration to administration. It's encapsulated in a nutshell with that aphorism that elections have consequences, but I, as I've seen firsthand at the FCC during my time, uh, the regulations do change over time, and that can lead to some unpredictability in what exactly the administrative state is going to do over a longer period of time. But nonetheless, let me offer a slightly different perspective, uh, one that is informed by, as you might expect, uh, empirical experience in one of those uh, independent agencies. Now, I think that generally speaking, it is ideal for Congress to speak with a clear and specific voice on matters of public concern. Of course, agencies at the end of the day are creatures of Congress. They act based on the organic statutes that have been passed by Congress as well as the Administrative Procedure Act. And so it follows that to the extent that Congress hasn't acted, uh, or has acted, but has acted in an arguably ambiguous way, uh, they are ceding some of the ground uh, to those agencies. Um, but, I, and I saw this on a couple of occasions when I was at the FCC, uh, there are many times when I thought that Congress should step in and provide clarity on an issue that had just consumed so much time and so much effort of the agency staff. Uh, the best example in my neck of the woods, my former neck of the woods, was uh, the issue called net neutrality, which you might have heard of. Uh, the internet, which is still around, you can now use it to Google what this issue was all about since the world didn't end and millions of people didn't die as a result of the decision we made in 2017. But in a nutshell, this issue had been kicking back and forth across administrations. In fact, back in January of 2014, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit said for the second time that the FCC's decisions under the Obama administration to impose these sort of net neutrality regulations exceeded the law. And so I put out a statement that very day in which I said, look, the courts have now told us that what we want to read into the Communications Act is not there. We should turn to Congress and let them make the decision, speak with the ideally bipartisan voice and tell us what you want the rules of the road to be in the digital economy. Nonetheless, the agency perceived correctly that legislation was not going to be forthcoming, and so they pushed it again a third time. They imposed net neutrality regulations in 2015, regulations that we then repealed in 2017. And there's no doubt that our 2017 decision did raise a lot of ire. It could be considered by many on the other side of the aisle to be extreme. In fact, as a noted technology policy expert, Senator Bernie Sanders said, this would be the end of the internet as we know it, and he decried the fact that the administration was making, as he put it, a unilateral decision that was contrary to the views of many of his constituents, many constituents across the country. Um, so I would say that in those types of situations, I would certainly prefer that Congress speak. 
But the problem is that so long as stasis is the norm in Congress and so long as the law on delegation and Chevron and all the rest is what it is, then it seems to me that I, I think those who consider themselves to be conservatives would be making a mistake from unilaterally disarming and foregoing making transformative decisions that are in the public interest uh, and are still legal, are upheld by the courts as such, which our net neutrality decision was, uh, when they are in charge of the executive branch and independent agencies. I would also note, in my limited time remaining, that there are solutions to this problem outside of curbing delegation uh, and uh, curbing Chevron. For example, uh, one of the unnoticed uh, stories over the last four years when I was leading the FCC was that we actually had quite a collaborative relationship with Congress when we saw gaps in the law. To give you one very simple example, I think everybody in this room would accept the premise that the United States has communications networks that should not include equipment or services that are considered insecure from a national security perspective. No brainer, right? So we used our authority, which was clear, to say that any federal funding coming from the FCC could not be used by telecom carriers going forward on equipment from these particular carriers, uh, Chinese companies Huawei and ZTE. The problem was that there was a huge amount of equipment, the vast majority of it that goes into our networks, does not use federal funding. And so the question became, well, FCC, what are you going to do about this? And I said, I looked at the Communications Act and said, we simply do not have authority. And so we went to Congress, the leadership of, of the Republicans and Democrats on the Senate Commerce Committee and the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Within three months, they crafted legislation called the Secure and Trusted Communications Network Act, passed on a voice vote signed by the president. And there are many other rifle shots, if you will, like that in which we go into Congress and because we had the flexibility to be able to target gaps in the law and work with Congress, we actually got the job done in a pretty admirable way, I'd like to think. A second solution I would commend is the more vigorous use of the traditional tools that Congress has at its disposal. Meaningful congressional oversight, for example. Now that I'm out of office and I don't have to testify in front of them, I can tell you that oversight is, should be deployed robustly and you should get all these agency heads up there to explain what it is they're doing and why. Uh, but more seriously, oversight can have a real effect. I can tell you that when you go up for a hearing and you have to testify and you notice that you know, these six senators on both sides of the aisle are asking you about something, it does raise the antenna of an agency head and you want to pay more attention to those issues. Similarly, I would argue that Congress has not exercised, as far as I can tell, the power of the purse as vigorously as they could. If they disagree with a particular agency interpretation, the appropriations process is a tried and true means, a constitutional means, of Congress registering that disapproval. And the final proposal I would suggest is something that uh, was first proposed by for, uh, Professor Nick Rosencrantz back in 2002. As one of the things that I found interesting is that Congress often passes substantive laws, but they don't give the agencies any guardrails on how particular terms and statutes should be interpreted. Yes, there's the Administrative Procedure Act, but you know, with Chevron deference, et cetera, agencies have a generally wide berth to interpret ambiguous terms. But he proposed, and I would agree, why doesn't Congress pass a law called the Federal Rules of Statutory Interpretation? Apply whatever canons you want to particular statutory terms. You can't apply this canon or not that one, for example. You can rely on this aspect of legislation history or not that one. It could be a general statute applicable to all administrative action, or it could be targeted at a particular agency or subject matter. But I think that would be a much more effective way for Congress to take some of the extremities, so to speak, out of these particular agency decisions, because then any party would know that, okay, regardless of who controls the White House, I have confidence that they are going to be bounded either by their own restraint or by a court on what they could do. So uh, I don't want to overstay my welcome in the grand tradition of Washington. Just wanted to throw a few ideas out there. I look forward to the exchange with my fellow panelists and uh, questions from the audience. Thank you. Well, I'm so delighted to be in person anywhere. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to the Federal Society to talk about the separation of powers. And unlike many people on my side of the aisle, I actually revere the separation of powers and have written about it in my very first law review article decades ago. Um, and so I'm, I'm delighted to talk about this today. I will tell you that I'm going to push back a little bit on the, about the premise of the panel seem to think that maybe the president doesn't always have an incentive to be unilateral. I mean, I think recently, like last week, we got a bipartisan infrastructure bill. Hmm. So <clears throat> one of the things I want to say is about the incentives for Congress, all right? And I recommend to you an article called The Secret Congress. It has recently been on the web, 
on a website called The Slow and the Boring. <laughs> Read it. It'll tell you something you don't want to hear, which is that Congress actually still passes laws. You haven't heard of them because they're slow and boring. There's a water treatment bill, a hate crimes act. Forget about the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. They've actually done things out of the public view. And that's my experience. My experience when I worked for the Senate was I spent more time with the other side. Joe Biden used to loan me to Orrin Hatch all the time. So my experience tells me that Congress actually gets more done than most people think by reading the newspaper. I have to confess that having worked in government, I'm one of 2% of law professors who've ever worked in a legislature. And then you add on that the fact that I worked in the White House, and that's pretty rare. And I'll tell you, the Wall Street Journal nor the New York Times has ever reported accurately on almost anything I've ever done. <laughs> and I'm entirely bipartisan about that and about the media. Um, so I want to push back about the premise of the panel and whether non-delegation would actually achieve what Professor Rapporteur and Professor McGinnis suggest, because I think there are actually incentives for presidents and Congress to do bipartisan things, and they're in the structure of the Constitution. So let me talk a little bit about uh, the structure and why I actually um, am eager to talk about it, because it's a little bit different. I'm going to ask you to do an intellectual shift about the separation of powers. So. Most people think the separation of powers is about adjectives. It's about executive, judicial, legislative, the vesting clauses. If that were true, our government would have collapsed a long time ago. Why? You can describe almost all of the departments as doing all of the functions that I just described. The truth is, if you read the text, there's something more important, and Madison thought it was more important because he called it the due foundation of the separation of powers in Federalist Number 51. And <clears throat> it's about elections. The text provides for self-government. This was what they were fighting, a monarchy. That was central to them. They spent the entire convention worried about who would elect whom. So you have the president who represents the nation another bipartisan concept, through the Electoral College, which gives the president incentives, in my view, to actually be bipartisan. The Senate represents now, because of an amendment, the people of the states. That's a different constituency. The senator from Alaska doesn't necessarily have to abide by roll tide, right? <laughs> they might not care what's going on in Alabama. Does the president? Yeah, he probably does. And the House represents even smaller populations. And that's in the text. To see how important this is, think of a different set of relationships. For most of the convention, the president was to be elected by the Congress. Did you know that? Imagine Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, Chuck Schumer electing the president. As Governor Morris said, it would be a Washington cabal. <laughs> And so, at the very end of the convention, they gave the president his own constituency. The Electoral College was the compromise. And that created the separation of powers. And if you don't believe me, you can read Michael McConnell's latest, greatest hits on the presidency, which is a terrific book. Um, as I said, I think you can also read this if you read the Federalist Papers. And I don't want you to pick and choose quotes like your friends at a cocktail party from this legislative history. I want you to read it sequentially. 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. And if you read the argument, you will see that Madison was saying separation of powers provisions in the constitutions of the states had failed. They were parchment barriers. And I did, this is my very first law review article. And what I found, if you read the argument fully, is that you see that Madison cared very much about how to structure a government, how to structure elections, appointment, and removal. And in this, I agree entirely with my um, friend, Steve Calabresi. Uh, <clears throat> so elections matter. They provide incentives. These incentives are not necessarily party incentives because parties were not in the original Constitution. So I trust the text more than you know, my husband's a political scientist, I hope he's not hearing, political scientists discussions about median voters. 
Um, <clears throat> so if this is premise is correct about the Constitution, I think unfortunately that political partisanship, I agree, is, is the, an issue of our time, which is why I was delighted to accept this invitation. It's not my personal experience of working in government. Um, and it's, it's very frightening. And it's frightening because I think it affects presidents as well as Congress. It affects all our institutions, including the Supreme Court, unfortunately. And I think it predicts the decline of admiration for all of our institutions that are elected. Or even now, the Supreme Court, because of the change in the cloture rule, you know, much more likely to get more extreme nominees. All right, well, I think I've been quick and depressing, not slow and boring uh, <laughs> with that, but hopefully I'll be able to answer your questions about anything, including delegation or independent agencies. Thank you for listening. It's great being here, and uh, thanks to the Federalist Society for inviting me. I'm going to talk a little bit about the ways party polarization has contributed to presidential unilateralism. This will supplement what Mike Rappaport started with, but it will provide a little bit more context to how we got to where we are today. One thing I'm not going to talk about, but I want to just flag, maybe for the Q&A, is uh, Congress years ago thought of an institutional design known as independent agencies uh, as a mechanism to have policy stability and avoid this whiplash phenomenon that people have spoken to. And it might be interesting to talk about whether that design structure works, and if it doesn't work, whether some of the reforms that Mike Rappaport has suggested, for example, whether they're likely to work or not work as well. Um, but let me start by quoting Justice Jackson in the steel seizure case because I think it puts into focus the incentives of Congress as compared to the incentives of the president. Justice Jackson said, I have no illusion that any decision by this court can keep power in the hands of Congress if it is not wise and timely in meeting its problems. If not good law, there was worldly wisdom in the maxim that the tools belong to the man who can use them. We may say that the power to legislate for emergencies belongs to the Congress, but only Congress itself can prevent power from slipping through its fingers. So what Jackson was saying, I think, recognizes what the incentives of Congress are as compared to the incentives of the president. For the president, whenever the president says he can do something, he is expanding or often expanding presidential power. The president is always incentivized to talk about his having legal authority for his actions. It could be an expansive understanding of what a statute means, an expansive understanding of what the Constitution means. But whenever the president says he can do something, he doesn't say, I can do it because I can do whatever I want, whether it's lawful or not. No, the president says it's lawful. And he has a theory behind it. And he is constantly advocating on behalf of presidential power. Congress is not like that at all. There's a collective action problem, for example. Members of Congress, in some sense, might care about, say, the war powers, but are they going to invest in blocking the president from pursuing a unilateral strike when they have to think about re-election and what their constituents want? So Congress will often trade off national interests and institutional interests in favor of local constituency. On top of that, when members of Congress do not approve of legislation, if they vote against it, they may actually argue that that legislation is not within Congress's power. So for the Affordable Care Act, for example, Republican members of Congress were not advocating for an expansive view of the Commerce Clause. They were advocating for a more moderate view of the Commerce Clause. So in Congress, you don't really have the advocacy on behalf of congressional power, and you don't have the incentive to advocate on behalf of congressional power. And I think that's a major problem when we think about when Congress can get involved in checking the president. So when can Congress check the president? I'm going to use the Watergate-era responses of Congress, the 
War Powers Resolution, the Impoundment Control Act, as examples of when Congress is willing to assert its institutional role. But when Congress did that in the early 1970s, you had two phenomena. You had essentially bipartisanship in Congress. The Democratic and Republican parties were not that different from each other. And you had the fact that voters were willing to come together, not as Democrats or Republican, but across the political spectrum, across the parties, to say that they wanted to place checks on the president. That was a time when George Wallace said there's not a dime's worth of difference between the Democrats and Republicans. And because there wasn't a dime's worth of difference between the Democrats and Republicans, they were able to work together across party lines to back legislation that was politically popular as well. That's not the world we live in today. The world we live in today, Democrats and Republicans are polarized, as noted, but they also don't like each other. For those of you all who have read about these studies of something known as effective polarization, Democrats don't want their sons and daughters to marry Republicans. Republicans don't want their sons and daughters to marry Democrats. They rate the other party on a 100 scale as a 20, as compared to the 1970s, where they might have rated them, I think, as around a 60. It's a very difficult time to get the parties to come together. As a result of this, members of the opposition party are not going to back the president's policy initiatives. Members of the president's party are not going to back the opposition party's initiatives. Not to say that there isn't legislation being enacted, but at the same time, there's a lot of gridlock. And as a result, there's space for the president to come in. When the president advances a policy initiative that the other party doesn't want, it may not get enacted, but if the president acts unilaterally, Congress is not going to override him because the president's party is going to back the president. And presidents, as a result, pursue policy, for example, through executive orders and directives. Uh, over the past 20 years, there have been about 800 executive orders. 96% of them go unchallenged. And presidents are filling the void left by the Congress in profound ways. And we all know of examples of this. You know, President Clinton couldn't get health care legislation through. He pursued some directives in that area. President Bush couldn't, George W. Bush couldn't get faith-based initiative proof. He proved initiatives, executive orders on faith-based initiatives. We hear today that uh, President Biden may respond to Congress's failure to enact the George Floyd Act by acting unilaterally. And this is the way it goes. And as a result, we see power slipping away from the Congress, the president gaining power. And I know that we're going to have a very robust conversation about the solutions to this. Uh, I am, I must say, very pessimistic that there is a solution that can break this polarization problem. But I'm hopeful that my panelists will convince me that my skepticism is misplaced. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's give uh, the panelists an opportunity to interact and uh, respond to each other. Professor Rappaport, um, do you have a, a response to some of what you've heard? Well, um, I guess um, Commissioner Pai and um, uh, Professor Nurse and Professor Neal, um, Devins, um, so, on the one hand, Professor Nurse says, oh, there is there is bipartisanship. <laughs> we do have compromise. And Professor Devon says, uh, no, we don't. So in, in a way, I'm, I'm sort of inclined to sort of let them duke it out um, uh, on this matter. I mean, look, I, I yes, in, in, the, in the rarest, in the most unusual situations, we do have a little bit of bipartisanship, right? So, so we've got um, you know a small number of of uh, Republicans who are willing to sign on to one portion or one of the infrastructure bills. That's that that's right. Um, that's not the kind of uh, bipartisanship you used to have um, 
with, let's say, the Medicare legislation that, that passed in the 60s. Um, uh, so yes, we, we do have a little bit um, of that, but, but by and large, I think it's, it's, it's everything that we see um, is, is people decrying over and over again that, that there isn't any uh, cooperation going on. And when presidents can do what they do, as, as Professor Devins points out, when they can, um, when the Congress doesn't act, they can take their own actions, and the Congress is not going to act because presidents are not going to take anything less than, than what they can do on their own. Um, we, we see this unilateralism situation happening, and as a result of it, we don't get compromise, and the parties get more and more uh, opposed to one another. So, um, is that really, though, a function of, um, of unilateralism, or is it a function of change in political parties and how they're structured? Because uh, you mentioned the Medicare Act, and, and you know, I think of, say, the civil rights legislation, which was bipartisan, but that's also because Democrats in the South voted against it and Republicans in the North voted uh, for it. The, the parties were very different and, and there was a lot more of a mix of ideologies within the parties. So look, the, the causes of polarization, I, don't, I certainly don't want to say that the, the sole cause of polarization has been presidential unilateralism. Um, certainly not. There's a number of things going on. But, um, and let's say during the, the 1960s when um, the parties were structured in such a way so the Democratic Party was really two different parties and the, we had liberal Republicans, um, some of the forces that might have led towards, um, w would have led presidential unilateralism to cause this polarization were, were um, tamped down precisely because the parties were different in these ways. Um, the problem with presidential unilateralism is that when that goes away, <laughs> then um, it gives full sway to sort of um, the more extreme action. So I'm not saying that's the sole cause of it, but, but I'm saying that um, when other circumstances change, it, 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 it no longer has any check. And if we didn't have presidential unilateralism, if we, if we had a structure that required the parties to, to, to cooperate, even without um, liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats, we would have much more of the parties getting along with one another or being forced to. I mean, just think about our president, right? So, so and, and the, um, Joe Biden was, was previously known as the, the moderate Democrat who liked to work with the other side, got along with all these people. Uh, what happened to that president? Um, so um, I think uh, more is going on, but this really a central feature is the presidential unilateralism in terms of allowing it to continue. Other panelists' reactions? If I may offer one point about delegation, as I said, I would certainly welcome Congress uh, including in bill language more specific terms to guide, if not altogether limit, agency action. Uh, but there, I think there are two different points that need to be considered. Uh, curbing delegation implies that Congress will act with more specificity, including very specific terms and language, as I said, to limit agency de decision making. But there are two different points uh, that I would make on that. Number one, I would argue that that in some cases would limit, if not preclude altogether, the likelihood of congressional decision making at all. Uh, so right now, of course, legislation often operates at a level that is sort of a variant of what Cass Sunstein once called an incompletely theorized agreement. Democrats and Republicans may agree on very high level principles and because they are unable to go one or two levels deeper in specified terms, they are happy to punt the overall implementation of that framework to an agency because otherwise the entire legislative purpose would founder as they sought to reach a compromise. And so if you require Congress to act with more specificity, it would be very, very difficult because I think that it, as pencils sharpened and you came to figure out, okay, are we really going down this fork or that one, uh, that initial bonhomie, so to speak, as the legislative process began, could very easily break down. And that would be especially the case if, as I you know, learned from experts on Twitter this morning, the filibuster remains in place. 
And so I would argue that delegation can actually uh, promote compromise in the legislative branch to some extent. Secondly, think about what legislation is at the end of the day. It is a snapshot of an issue or a marketplace at a moment in time. And if there's one thing we've learned at any field from you know, technology to energy, those snapshots can quickly become faded with age. And so I think you also run the risk of inevitably coming back to where you started, where some of these terms that have you know, become outmoded or archaic, the agencies are struggling to implement them, and in some cases have to implement them because they are law, and it actually disserves the public interest at the end of the day. So in many cases, uh, and you see this, you know, conservatives have sometimes criticized the Endangered Species Act for being far too restrictive in this regard. Courts have repeatedly said that agencies don't have discretion there. Uh, similarly, those on the progressive side have complained about certain statutes that they complain don't allow them to do as much as they would like to do. Uh, so you, you might see uh, that a broad delegation of authority, one that allows agencies, expert agencies, to fill in some of the color, if you will, could at the end of the day be the half a loaf that is better than no loaf at all. Professor Nurse? Yeah, I, I think that um, I have great sympathy with that comment. I think that uh, there are times where Congress focuses very much on specific details. Um, I've been in rooms where people stay up 24 hours to try to hammer out specific language. But there are often times when delegation actually solves this problem because they don't know the technicalities. They don't understand the internet. They don't understand, you know, how something is implemented. And they do this with courts as well. Um, so I'm, I'm nervous about eliminating delegation. I also, just as a constitutionalist, I'd say that I worry that the court, um, even if it were to go down that road, could implement it. I think what would happen is something that would happen um, with the traditional state function doctrine. The court has tried several times to embrace federalism. And each time, it could not manage the doctrinal test. And so then it had to push back and return. They did this with traditional state function, then they did it again with Morrison and Lopez, and then we got you know, Reich, the Commerce Clause cases. So I'm worried that um, if I were a judge, I couldn't define precisely enough in that what would be too broad of a delegation. And so I think there may be five votes for that on the court, just saying as a practical matter, whether this, you know, there you go. Um, so I'm very sympathetic with uh, the comments that have just been made, and Mike, I'm going to join those who are not sympathetic to your <laughs> recommendation with respect to uh, the non-delegation doctrine. Um, and uh, you know, so I'm thinking of what's a solution here. I don't think the independent agency model is a solution, and I think actually one of the lessons of the independent agency model is that presidents actually are able to, um, through making good appointments in particular, uh, are able to advance their own policy agenda through the independent agencies. So how do you get Congress more engaged, right? And I'm not sure if there's a good solution, but I've thought of a couple of things that might, at the margins, be helpful. Um, one is to have more professional staff in Congress. Um, you know, when uh, uh, Newt Gingrich became the Speaker of the House way back when, in 1995, he pursued a major transformation of power away from the committees and to leadership the staff associated with leadership essentially doubled. The staff associated with committees essentially was cut in half or nearly in half. And I think if you have more professional staff on committees, uh, you might have more policy continuity, more of a commitment to the uh, committee's jurisdiction. Uh, another possible reform that at the margins might be helpful, I don't think any of these are uh, solutions in a, some permanent way, but just at the margins, things that might be marginally helpful, is to maybe allow committee chairs to serve uh, multiple terms, serve longer terms. There are restrictions on how long committee chairs can serve in the Senate, for example. And I think maybe if you have uh, more of a stakeholder through the committee chair, uh, that might get uh, Congress uh, more engaged and that committee chair would have more incentive uh, both as an expert and also uh, given his, uh, rep his or her reputation associated with the committee jurisdiction, more of a commitment to work with the minority to get the committee to accomplish something. Again, I don't know whether those reforms will accomplish much, but uh, I, I think they're worth considering at least. <laughs> 
Um, I, yes, you want to speak since, in defense? Since I'm, I'm losing my uh, uh, support for non-delegation. <laughs> um, so, um, the commissioner says um, uh, delegation can promote bipartisanship um, because they don't have to uh, agree on the details, and, and I suppose that is one way you get legislation passed these days. Um, but uh, the problem is when you when you delegate, then you've got the problem of of presidential unilateralism operating. So I'm I'm not really sure we, the bipartisanship is worth much. Yes, you've got a bipartisan delegation. Um, they 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 do reach agreement now because there's been a delegation, um, but uh, uh, that doesn't mean in a world where you couldn't delegate, they wouldn't be forced to reach agreement in different ways. Um, you know, you can make compromises in different ways. All right, you you Republicans, you get your way on 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 issue one, and Democrats, you get your way on issue two. Right? There's there's other ways of of reaching agreement than simply punting it to the executive. Um, with respect to the Supreme Court and what Professor Nur says, I, I don't think it was an inability of the court to manage federalism doctrine. It was a failure of will. Um, the, the, the court, you know, uh, um, the court was not willing to, to go ahead um, with these ideas um, that they had started down the road with. So um, uh, I guess I don't think that there's a, um, not that it's, it's, it, it would be the easiest area of constitutional law, but but I I do think that the the court um, you know blinked <laughs> in Raich um, and and in some o some other cases. And um, for Professor Devins, I I quite agree that that having a a more elaborate uh, professional staff uh, would be a great thing for Congress to have. But I don't see that as an alternative to the non-delegation doctrine. I see that as a way of implementing the non-delegation doctrine, right? If, if, if Congress doesn't know what it's doing now um, and needs to delegate, um, and they, they need to then have a more elaborate staff in order to figure out what the rules should be, that would be great. That's, that's something that, that would help. Subject to civil service rules, then we're going to end up with the deep state of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Um, unless there are other, uh, the, the panelists want to say something more in exchange of uh, views, I think we may be at a point where we can uh, start taking uh, questions. Um, so, um, Roger Pilon. Yes, well, thank you very much, uh, Bill. Uh, Roger Pilon, Cato Institute. Uh, question for Professor Devins. Uh, you have called for more experts in Congress. Uh, that comes right out of Progressivism 101, of course, rule by experts, and it brings us back to the non-delegation doctrine. Um, were the non-delegation doctrine to be upheld, you would therefore require Congress to make this uh, agreement or reach it. If it couldn't, then you wouldn't have so much legislation for the administrative agencies to work with, and we'd get back to limited government. Uh, was that a question? Yes, it's a question for <laughs> Professor Devins. Why do you think that experts will solve the problem? They are the problem. <laughs> well, <laughs> the question in, in some measure is, can you get Congress to enact specific legislation when there is such partisan disagreement? And I think the possibility of getting Congress, and I understand what Mike is saying, that if you have the doctrine, you'll put pressure on Congress, they'll have no choice but to come together. Uh, I'm not so certain that Congress will come together. Uh, and and so, and so yeah. What? The problem is, I think the premise of Roger's question is uh, he thinks it's a good thing when government doesn't do anything. Right. And, 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 uh, <laughs> yeah. And your I, I, and, and and some of your premises is we want government to do things, right? I think we want government to at least be functional. 
um, and uh, having. I'm not sure Roger agrees with that. I, uh, <laughs> yes, and, and, and right, we may be ships passing in the night in that sense. Uh, but uh, I think the notion of uh, professional staff in Congress, as I said, it's at the margins, right? So the question is, how do you get Congress to be more invested in legislation to do, for example, what Mike was saying before, to be able to actually have the expertise to figure out a way to have specificity if you're concerned with delegation. Um, but getting a functional Congress, I think uh, having uh, power back in the committees, having a stronger professionalization of committee staff, having members with stronger stakes in their committees, uh, I'm just saying maybe it's not a bad idea. Uh, it's associated with a period of time when Congress was less polarized. I'm not saying it will make Congress less polarized, but uh, those were uh, some of the conditions uh, in Congress at a time when Congress was less polarized. So maybe uh, that will be of some marginal benefit. Can I just add one thing? I think the likelihood of Congress passing legislation to add professional staff is zero. Hmm. Um, Why is that? Electoral incentives. Mm -hmm. Elections. Mm -hmm. Do I want to go back and uh, campaign in Georgia or Alabama on, I just added myself more staff? Mm -hmm. it's, that's, that's not going to happen. It, and it, the reason it's not going to happen also, and this is my pet peeve, I'm not advocating that necessarily. I thought I was pretty expert when I worked in the Senate. Um, so. I think that, unfortunately, when I went to interview members in the 2000 era, I found that people were being elected to hate Congress, to have contempt for Congress. And if you have contempt for Congress, it will become contemptible. There's a self-fulfilling prophecy there. And it, it makes me very nervous. Why? It's Article One for a reason. We fought for a legislature against a king. Now, I understand fully the problems with statutory interpretation with giving broad delegations, I understand that. There are other ways you could solve that. You could have a referral system where courts would refer back to Congress. South African Constitution has something like that. So I'm, I'm not certain that non-delegation is the answer. I like the rules of statutory interpretation, but in fact there are canons in law that no one knows of because the mm -hmm. revisor's office puts them in the notes. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds of them now. Mm -hmm. They're in the notes, they're not in the text. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think there are ways around this, but the, the, what disturbs me more than, um, more than political polarization is really just contempt for American institutions. I believe in you know, a very robust civic education for lawyers and everyone else. Okay, next question, here at the front. Hi, John Carlo. Uh, Professor Richard Epstein advances uh, a proposal I think would, would upset Roger, but maybe not terribly, and I think in part addresses Commissioner Pai and uh, Professor N uh, Nurse's um, comments about Congress lacking expertise, which is that courts, uh, and it's a, it's a deference-based remedy, if you will, that courts ought to give uh, de novo review to an agency's legal determinations, but something like clear error review to their factual determinations, which take into account their expertise. I'm just curious what you make of that and, and how it fits into this issue of polarization, and would it to, to Professor Rappaport's point, be partially a solution. That could be very interesting. I mean, I think that would be akin to the Rosencrantz proposal, which is essentially uh, you know, prescribe the rules for decision with respect to uh, you know, the, the legal uh, determinations, but then you know, perhaps defer to the agency on you know, what types of equipment or services should be covered that go into a communications network, or whether this particular migratory bird should be protected or not as it goes from Mexico to the United States. I mean, things that courts are generally speaking not going to be as expert in second guessing, I think it's fair to say. So I, I would certainly be open to that. And uh, that's, I, I completely agree with Professor Rappaport that you know, they, that sort of delegation that I was talking about earlier does run the risk, essentially, of the unilateral decision making. But to the extent that it could be cabined by those types of rules of statutory interpretation, then I think every party that ha is uh, signing on to this kind of delegation legislation would know or would have some confidence in a president, regardless of party, being hemmed in within some certain guidelines. You know, you're not just cutting a blank check and saying, via con Dios, you're just uh, letting them make decisions within an understandable framework. 
That's a great suggestion, though. I would actually say that the Professor Epstein's suggestion is actually what I think the original meaning of the APA was. So <laughs> it's not just from Professor Epstein, but. So we'll take a, we're going to alternate between the microphones. We'll take a question from the um, back. Yes, uh, Professor Selman. Sure. Ilya Selman, George Mason University. Uh, my question is about uh, delegation or non-delegation, that uh, there are some on the right, I don't share this view myself, but there are some who are deeply opposed to delegation to agency, or at least think there's too much of it, but they don't mind delegation to the president, so they don't like delegations to the deep state, but they're fine, to a large extent at least, with delegation to the surface state, uh, you know, the person you know, at the top of the executive branch hierarchy. So my question is from the standpoint of polarization, do you, any of the panelists think that there is a distinction to be made between these two kinds of delegations where one is the president or perhaps to his highest level subordinates, uh, the ones he appoints himself, whereas others uh, might be to administrative agencies, perhaps even independent agencies. So is there one type of this of delegation here that is uh, better or worse than the other uh, for polarization? Uh, and if so, why? Thank you. Well, I guess I think in the main there's not really significant, I mean, there, there are differences obviously between those two types of delegations, but from, from my perspective, the, um, the unilateralism uh, is going to be a problem for both of them. Um, obviously, to, to the extent that we're talking about executive branch agencies, then the president's going to be able to control um, those actions in any event. So I'm not sure how much of a distinction there is, assuming the president wants to, to, to get involved. Um, with independent agencies, I suppose there, 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 there can be differences, but um, it's certainly my understanding, and I think the, the, the literature would back me up, although um, I have to see what uh, Chairman Pai says, um, uh, that they're, they're pretty much following what presidents want anyway. Um, so uh, in there, there may be some differences in particular circumstances, but to me, uh, delegations in both cases have the principal evils. Other, other panelists? Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I, I think uh, what Mike said is just right, and I just want to, uh, uh, well, you can speak about the FCC, of course, but uh, I, I'm doing some work with the political scientists of Vanderbilt, Dave Lewis, and based on surveys of uh, both uh, political appointees and senior executive service supervisors, um, the line between independent executive agencies is not that sharp. Uh, you know, uh, independent agencies uh, are generally under the control of the president, if not at the get-go uh, very shortly thereafter uh, through critical appointments of the chair uh, and indeed related to polarization when a majority of the president's party is a majority of the commission, uh, they generally do the bidding of the president's party because now we live in this polarized world where the president's party essentially agrees with each other. You don't have that policy divergence within the majority party of the commission, uh, but uh, the chairman should speak to that because he lived it. Yeah, certainly we operated independently uh, from the White House during my time. I mean, there are a number of different issues where I think it's fair to say the White House preferred course A and we chose course B. Um, so, you know, I think it depends, of course, on the composition of the particular multi-member agency. But I would like to think that my counterparts at other agencies and I uh, certainly conducted ourselves independently. There were times when we had to collaborate, of course, and keep them informed on things like spectrum auctions or whatever. But I think actually the independence of the model was maintained for the most part, uh, at least in my experience. The second thing I would point out is that the, the nature of delegation can also be, it can vary. So I, I don't think we're talking about delegation simply as a blank check, you know, here are purposes A, B, and C, go do it, independent agency. There are also types of delegations that people in this room might like. For example, uh, Section 10 of the Telecom Act of 1996, 47 USC 160, is essentially a deregulatory ratchet, and it says there's this whole corpus of telecom laws dating back to 1934. 
We authorize the commission, we require the commission to take a look at these uh, upon its own motion or when someone else petitions, and the agency shall, shall repeal those that it determines are no longer necessary in the interest of competition or the public interest. Same thing on the media ownership side. The FCC has media ownership regulations dating back to 1975 dictating who, what newspaper can buy what radio station, all kinds of micromanaging regulations. But in 1996, Congress said instead of you know, supplanting those with its own specific, specific rules, it had a deregulatory ratchet. It said every couple of years, the FCC has to look at these rules and decide which should be revised or repealed given the changes in, mar in the marketplace. And so those are the kinds of deregulatory delegations I might think you might say that might actually be uh, you know, progressive from our perspective in the sense of uh, you know, allowing the agencies to do something within the framework Congress might envision. I just want to push back a little bit on the notion that there is no difference. I actually think it's quite dangerous to put everything in the White House um, for whatever president. Obviously, Article 2 requires you to execute a law, so there must be a law. And presidents do push the envelope. President Obama pushed the envelope. He knew he was pushing the envelope. But if you channel everything into the White House, like, you don't want them regulating nuclear power. I mean, really. I mean, <laughs> there is a level of expertise that you want. So I, I would be nervous about, um, I understand because of the unitary executive and the notion that the president alone, you know, has the executive power. The problem is the president literally is never alone. I hate to tell you that. Um, <laughs> he's got a massive entourage, even when he sleeps. Um, the president alone is operating both for the nation, and there's lots of internal rules about when he does things for the nation, when he does political stuff. But that line is very tenuous. Um, and I, I'm very nervous about giving folks inside the White House more power than they already have, as opposed to the agencies, because I think it would aggravate uh, political partisanship. I can't resist um, uh, uh, following up on uh, uh, Chairman Pai's point. Um, the idea, if we're going to have delegations, <laughs> the idea of deregulatory delegations, I think, is a great idea. Um, and in fact, to, to really see it operate, rather than you know ask the FCC to to the f figure out which of their regulations um, should be eliminated, I would actually like to see an agency created that's a deregulatory agency. It would be filled with people who who's going to want to be part of that agency? Well, people who are in favor of deregulation. And then they would have authority to repeal regulations of other agencies. So I actually think if we're going to have this, the, the, this delegation type system, there's things we can do in order to push back against uh, excessive regulation. OK, let's have a question from the front. I'm Mike Ferris from Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, my uh, concern arises from Article 1, Section 1. All legislative authority is vested in Congress. All power to make rules is not merely to protect the power of Congress. It's to protect the rights of the voters. The voters have the c core ability to throw the rascals out if they don't like the law being made. But when the regulatory agencies or the president is acting alone, you don't have the same power to throw the rascals out. Uh, like we just threw the rascals out in Virginia, we didn't like what was going on there, we threw the rascals out. But the agencies, it, it's nigh unto impossible to change those rules. Why are the voters left out of all the discussion of this whole doctrine of regulation, or, or delegation rather? I don't know, I thought, Professor Nurse, that you began with a d discussion <laughs> of elections. <laughs> Well, I agree with you. I mean, it's not for the Congress, it's for the voters. And I think they can get rid of the president, you know. <laughs> and they had just did. I mean, they may just do it again. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I understand that, that um, voters may feel that they don't have access to this. The question is, if you ask them, I just recently did an empirical study asking people, well, you know, what would be the ordinary meaning of things? And would you rely on lawyers? And they actually relied on lawyers for lots of legal meetings. So people do rely on experts. I really don't necessarily want the voters running the nuclear you know, regulatory agency. Um, I want someone who understands the internet <laughs> to run you know, the FCC. Um, <clears throat> so I understand, but the question is, would the voters, and I, and I understand probably many voters here want to get rid of Congress. I personally don't want to do that. 
Others want to get rid of agencies because they're more removed. Um, but even the Supreme Court in the original Chevron decision believed that there is some electoral accountability in the Constitution for agency action. And I think Professor Devins is right and, Professor, and Director Pai is right. Presidents can control even independent agencies if they want to. They're not very good presidents if they can't figure out how to pick up the phone. So. Um, so one, I mean, I'm sympathetic to, to, to the question, um, but if you think about it, uh, it would be nice if the voters, instead of saying, oh, this is what the legislature has done, let's, let's change them, would sometimes say, oh my God, what, what's the legislature done here? They've given all this power to unelected bureaucrats. Let's throw those rascals out, that is the legislators who did that. And unfortunately, um, the voters don't do that very often, which is part of the reason why Congress finds it so attractive to give the power to the bureaucrats. Question in the back. Keith, uh, Keith Rothfuss, Pittsburgh, PA, having served in the House from 2013 to 2019. Uh, I think the concentration of power, whether in an agency or among congressional leadership, has contributed to polarization. Uh, we're removing the people uh, uh, and, and taking away their voice when this happens. And so I, I've been a big fan of the RAINS Act for, for years, uh, where you make the representatives accountable for the laws th that are being made. To, to Ferris's point, all laws are supposed to be made by Congress, not by this branch that's not accountable. And I just disagree with the professor. Uh, there is very little accountability for these uh, administrative agencies. Um, so it's this concentration of power that's whether it, it, in the uh, agencies or in congressional leadership. And, and you see that there when they shut down the amendment process. And, and rather than being able to debate an amendment on the floor, people are running to Twitter or a cable show to make their case because leadership's not letting them do that. They package these bills together, maybe six, eight, ten people having very substantive in, input. That process has to be opened up completely. And frankly, the congressional Keith, schedule uh, contributes Keith. to that. Flying in on a Monday and flying on, flying on a Thursday uh, does empower the leadership uh, and the folks in this town. Do you have a question? Um, yeah, I would just think the, 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 the idea being this concentration of power and how do you diffuse the power away from those centers? Uh, I think that's contributed to polarization. Could I just respond to the, the, the focus on the, the House? The House operates completely differently from the Senate. There's an old joke. You know, it's not Republicans and Democrats who hate each other, but the House and the Senate. Um, this is why we see what we do in the, the papers as if it really is true that, that two senators can control something. Sometimes, but not, not so much as you think. The House is, has given too much power to the leadership to control the docket. There's no question. If I were to change Congress, you had some proposals, I would open that up. You can't have the kind of closed rules you have in the House. The Senate, once you get past 60, you know, it has to be germane, but I've sat through 200 amendments, mm -hmm. you know? So I agree with you about the House. I think that's a really serious problem. Any others? Yes. Thank you. Hi, am I live? Uh, Brooks Harlow, uh, Technology and Communications Law is the name of my law firm, so I come out of uh, commission, uh, Chairman uh, Pye's world, and I try to look at technology and how that impacts things. And my question is, is polarization uh, caused by Washington, D.C. and government, or is it caused by Silicon Valley and the technology? In particular, as you all know, we all have these cell phones. Half the people are looking at them now instead of listening to me. I don't blame you. <laughs> so you, you click on something or you put something on social media and they track your usage and they push. If you, if you click on leftist articles, you get more leftist articles. And the more leftist articles you click on, the increasingly left you get. Same thing on the right. Of course, the news media and all the other websites respond to that because it's competitive. And so they feed more and more polarized stories. So the question is, what's the cause and the effect? Is it Washington, D.C., or is it Silicon Valley and the technology? Yeah, well, there may be multiple causes. Right. And I think uh, certainly, uh, and Chairman Pye will, should definitely jump in on this, but I think uh, you know, technology and personalized media and the fact that we no longer live in uh, local and state communities where we focus on local and state issues, reading local newspaper, watching local news, but everything is now 
customized and oriented towards one or another often political extreme. Uh, arguably, the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine has yes. contributed to this as well in changing uh, how media operates. So let me pose a question to you, Chairman. Uh, what would you think of returning the Fairness Doctrine? Would that be uh, a solution to our problems? <laughs> Well, first of all, I'm out of office, so no more answering questions for me at an oversight hearing. But uh, no, but seriously, I, I would definitely oppose that. I mean, I think it was just a disaster from the inception. And I think uh, one of my predecessors, uh, Dennis Patrick, did a fantastic job in the Reagan administration putting it in the scrap heap of regulatory history where it belonged. I just think it, it, having regulators sit in judgment of content is always uh, a topic that's fraught with peril. And so I, for both First Amendment and just general prudential concerns, I would, I, I would tend to oppose it. But um, but I do think that a lot of what Brooks said did resonate with me. I gave a speech four years ago this month, as a matter of fact, where I talked about my view that social media and all of these other you know, technologies, which do have some upsides, I will concede, nonetheless seem to coarsen our culture in pretty meaningful ways, ways that I think do re relate to this topic. And I think part of it is just the disintermediation that you know, you're, when you're having a conversation with somebody on social media, you're not in the same physical presence. And so you say things on social media that you would never say if you were in the presence of these people. And this includes even Congress people now who are interacting with each other on social media in ways they would never do in person. And the secondly is just the anonymity of it. Uh, I think the sort of the, un uh, the American id for many people has been unleashed for those who just can say whatever they want because, you know, are just completely anonymous, and I understand, of course, the constitutional protections for anonymous speech, but there are, it does make our, uh, our culture a lot coarser when you have that type of discourse. And so I don't pretend to have any solutions to any of that, uh, but it, it is a major factor. Social media, cable news, all the rest of it. It's just the cacophony is such that, you know, when I talked to my predecessors going all the way back to you know, Newt Minow, the President Kennedy's first FCC chair, and I've talked to them about their experiences in this job, many of them have marveled, like, I have no idea how I would do this job from in 2020 or 2017. It's just a completely, Instead of looking at the piece of paper and trying to figure out what the right answer is, you've got to worry about whether or not Bette Midler is going to roast you on Twitter, which is something like <laughs> what a surreal state of affairs. But it's uh, you know that, that's just the state that's that's America in 2021 for better or worse. Mm -hmm. Question from the back, uh, Larry Ebner from the Atlantic Legal Foundation. What is the solution where the president knowingly takes ultra-virus? unilateral action because he knows that with the help of the Justice Department, it will take the courts forever to invalidate the action. Impeachment? <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> I think you might need to lean into the mic. Impeachment? <laughs> Is there any other solution? I think that was the answer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, up front. Randall Johnson, uh, various jobs, and I am now back with the government, which I won't identify where I am. Uh, but um, one thing we did get done when we took over in 1995 was passage of the Congressional Review Act, which was our attempt, in fact, to compromise between delegation and non-delegation in the sense of when a, regu when, when a major reg was passed by the Congress, I mean by an agency, it could be repealed by Congress under a non-filibuster rule and expedited consideration. And so I, I just, I'm just throwing it out to the panel, particularly Michael, do you think that was an effective compromise? Apparently not, but uh, that it was useful or not, or because it, in fact we got the Clinton ergonomics reg repealed under that, Trump got it repealed, now Biden did later on, it's been quite effective actually in major regs, and I think it was a useful compromise between pure delegation and non-delegation. So I was just throwing it out to the panel that, Victoria, you might have been up there when we passed it, I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, I think it actually, I, I, it's turned out to be a useful tool for when you move from a president of, of one party to, to the other, um, especially where um, the new president has both houses. Um, I don't know if you guys, when you wrote it, anticipated that or it just uh, worked out that way. Um, Unfortunately, because it, it, it allows the regulation to take effect and then requires Congress to repeal it, it's not going to be that effective most of the time um, because uh, the, the, the president um, can just veto, right? So if you don't have a change from, from one administration to another, um, even if both houses of Congress wanted to get rid of the regulation, 
um, the, the, the president can just veto that. And that's why I think, you know, w with the exception of the ergonomics um, one, we don't really have any examples of the Congressional Review Act working except when we got to change from one administration to another. So I think it was a step in the right direction, you know, good, but, but um, I'd like to take some more leaps in that direction. Others? Yeah. Anyone else? No. Question? Hi, my name is Marissa Cohen. I'm getting my LLM in constitutional law at Emory. Um, question I think that draws on uh, all of your presentations is, so if we take the idea that Oliver Wendell Holmes said, which is, if my fellow citizens want to go to hell, I'll help them, it's my job. Right, so this idea that one is that Did you read that on the internet? No, no, that's a real quote. Really? Yeah, yeah. I promise you. <laughs> okay. I shouldn't be the only one that knows that though, by the way. <laughs> um, so, but the idea is sort of that there shouldn't be a branch that has like this heroic power to do something over another branch. And that can kind of play into both the delegation and the non-delegation ar uh, argument, right? Like you were saying, Chairman, that you saw that Congress wasn't doing anything, so the agency stepped up and did something. So then in sort of a way, because Congress wasn't doing its job, you kind of aggrandized one branch in order to fill that gap. But then Professor Rappaport said that the court should just say that delegation is unconstitutional, and then isn't the judiciary then becoming more powerful and then not allowing Congress to decide who it wants to give the power to? Because to summarize what I think James Madison was going for in the Federalist Papers is what Meatloaf said as two out of three ain't bad, right? You want to have something go through another branch before you do it. So by you seeing a branch not doing something and stepping in, did you ultimately you did either is either role usurping their own job and becoming too powerful? Are we supposed to kind of just let there be a little crash and burn so that everybody can get their training wheels back on? So, oh, sorry, go no, on. No, no, not you. Um, you know, if you think, as I do, that the non-delegation doctrine is in is in the Constitution then um, what the court would be doing would not be aggrandizing power, but simply enforcing the Constitution. I think actually one of the problems with uh, um, Oliver Wendell Holmes is he was willing to let, you know, the current generation of Americans um, go, uh, go, go to hell if they wanted to, even though it was contrary in some instances to, to what the Constitution said. So um, if you sort of re reorient his, his statement as, well, I don't care what the Constitution means, I'll, I'll let the current generation, you know, uh, go to hell. I, I think that's exactly what the Constitution was designed to stop <laughs> from, from happening. So, um, uh, okay. not a big fan of Holmes, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes two of us. <laughs> No, I would generally agree with that. I mean, again, to borrow from Meatloaf, you know, I would do anything for the public interest, but I won't do that because, I mean, obviously, the, the Constitution at the end of you know, the Constitution and the laws of the United States ultimately have to be the lodestar for any agency, whether it's independent or part of the executive branch. And so, I think uh, you know, just doing things that are good ideas. It's uh, yeah, I agree. It's ultimately uh, the usurpation of the structure. And so, anyway, yeah, I think I agree with Professor Rappaport in large. It's been nearly 40 years since the Federalist Society was founded, and I think, you know, every every year has a first, and now we have the first conference where Meatloaf is um, providing <laughs> commentary um, for panels. <laughs> um, anything else? Uh, Leah, let me make one comment, which is, you know, there's this question of partisanship on the court today and polarization related to the court. And I guess there's a question of how far the court should go before risking its own legitimacy in some sense in terms of interventions into things like non-delegation and how strict a rule the court might enforce. If it's a vague rule, then it's going to be subject to manipulation. If it's a really strict rule, how much of the government will be shut down as a result? So I think these are concerns uh, maybe not for this panel per se, but in terms of uh, if you want the courts to play this role, you have to think about whether the courts are well suited to play this role. Yeah. Might there be a problem of unilateralism from, from the courts? 
that will lead to more polarization, uh, Professor Rappaport? I mean, some might argue that unilateralism by the judiciary has produced more difficulty in judicial selection. Well, um, judicial selection is, is an area <laughs> where we, we have difficulties. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess I could wish that, that the, the judges were, were originalists, um, and, I, and I then think we would have less of a problem that way than if they could just decide uh, to go off in, in, in their own direction there. Um, and I, I guess I think, you know, that's the ultimate solution in this area. Maybe, it, maybe it's a bit of a pipe dream in the sense of, of I, I, it would be nice to see democratic justices who, and there are some certainly democratic academics who are originalists who, who, who sign on to, to, to that idea. And I think in, in a world where people were, where justices were originalists, maybe there'd be different kinds of originalists, um, but there would be justices, um, it would be a real big step in the right direction. Judge, if I might add a point, I mean, your uh, point touches on something that I was thinking about, uh, an interesting thought experiment. Let us suppose that you got rid of Chevron deference tomorrow. And so, in time, how would political actors in the Congress, Senate and the House, view judicial interpretations of agency decision making? Would they see it as essentially judicial lotteries, right? Whatever the law is depends on what particular panel you have to draw, uh, you draw in the D.C. Circuit or one of the regional circuits. And that, in turn, over time, theoretically could increase an, you know, this scrutiny on judicial nominees, which is already pretty substantial. So I, mean, I think the locus of decision-making can shift, and so that could also bring with it you know, the attendant risks of polarization in a different forum. In this case, judicial confirmation, which you, know, you obviously know far better than I do. Well, are there any concluding remarks anybody uh, wants to make? We don't have anyone else lined up for a question. I'd just like to add for the student from uh, my former law school at Emory, I have a chair there. Um, you know, there are people who are uh, on the conservative side who don't accept Professor Rappaport's version of the separation of powers or non-delegation, and it's not just those that Professor Solman was talking about earlier. Uh, take the dean of the Harvard Law School, John Manning. Uh, he does not believe, based on the text of the Constitution, since there is no separation of powers provision in the Constitution, it was rejected, not once but twice, that the court should not enforce separation of powers principles. That's based on his view of the text of the Constitution, which suggests to me, and my review of this last term, there are six justices who are textualists and in statutory interpretation. There was a lot of disagreement, a lot of disagreement. And that's because text is actually too little information to actually cr provide the kind of unity that you would hope for on the bench, in my view. So there, even within originalism and textualism, there are very strong divisions, as Professor Rapporteur knows, because he runs this originalism conference. I have colleagues who go to it who call themselves liberal originalists. Um, but I think for the students in the audience, you should know that they, and realize that there is a division of opinion um, within the textual school about what you should do with respect to the separation of powers. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be teaching uh, my seminar on textualism Monday morning in, at the University of Alabama, and the, <laughs> uh, and the topic for discussion will be my colleague Professor Groves's article, Witch Textualism. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. <laughs> say hello to Tara. She's welcome. <laughs> will do. I guess uh, I would say... Uh, um, uh, I, I do disagree with uh, John Manning um, uh, a, a bit on separation of powers issues, but you know, if the range on the Supreme Court were from Rappaport to Manning, that'd be a big improvement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, will you all join me in uh, giving appreciation to our panel?